that is to get the support of the people. We need to help the Pakistani government go into Waziristan, where I visited a very rough country, and, and get the support of the people and get them to work with us and turn against the cruel Taliban and others. And, th and by working and coordinating our efforts together, not threatening to attack them, but working with them and where necessary, use force, but talk softly, but carry a big stick. Tom, so just, 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 a, just, just a quick follow-up on this. I, I think if we're going to have follow-ups, then I will want follow-ups. No, no, I know. That was so but I so think we'll get at me. it if I can be with fine this with question. Me. Uh, if uh, I let's can. have one. All right, let's well, have a follow-up. Well, just, 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 just a quick follow-up because I think sure. I think this is important. I'm just a hired health here, so <laughs> I mean, you're doing a great job, Tom. <laughs> Look, uh, I, I want to be very clear about what I said. Nobody called for the invasion of Pakistan. Senator McCain continues to repeat this. What I said was the same thing that the audience here today heard me say, which is if Pakistan is unable or unwilling to hunt down bin Laden and take him out, then we should. Now, that I think has to be our policy because they are threatening to kill more Americans. Now, Senator McCain suggests that somehow, you know, I'm green behind the ears and you know, I'm just spouting off, and he's somber and responsible. I, Thank Senator, you very Sen much. Sen <laughs> Senator McCain, this is the guy who sang Bomb, Bomb, Bomb Iran, who called for the annihilation of North Korea. That, I don't think, is an example of speaking softly. This is the person who, after we, had, we hadn't even finished Afghanistan, where he said, next up, Baghdad. So uh, I agree that we have to speak responsibly and we have to act responsibly and the reason Pakistan the the popular uh, opinion of America had diminished in Pakistan was because we were supporting a dictator Musharraf had given him seven, uh, ten billion dollars over seven years and he had suspended civil liberties we were not promoting democracy this is the kind of policies that ultimately end up undermining our ability to fight the war on terrorism and it will change when I'm president uh, Tom, if, you, if we're going to go back and forth, I then I'd like to have equal time to go to respond. Yeah, to, you get to, uh, to, to last word here, and then I mean, we have to move on. Not true, not true. I have obviously supported those efforts that the United States had to go in militarily, and I have opposed those that I didn't think so. I understand what it's like to send young Americans in harm's way. I say, I was joking with a veteran, I hate to even go into this, I was joking with an old veteran friend who joked with me about Iran. But the point is that I know how to handle these, these, these crises. And Senator Obama, by saying that he would attack Pakistan, look at the context of his words. I'll get Osama bin Laden, my friends, I'll get him. I know how to get him. I'll get him no matter what. And I know how to do it. But I'm not going to telegraph my punches which is what Senator Obama did. And I'm going to act responsibly as I have acted responsibly throughout my military career and throughout my career in the United States Senate. And we have fundamental disagreements about the use of military power and how you do it. And you just saw it in response to previous questions. Welcome to the Michael Brooks Show. Salutations, left is best. We're broadcasting back live for the people in downtown Brooklyn, USA with super producer Matt Leck. Hello. Chief economist David Briscoe. How's it going? Super producer David Slavic roaming the TMBS Digitosphere in the ever-aggressive, ever-growing TMBS universe. On this week's program, Ken Klippenstein will join us. He's an investigative reporter for the TYT Network as well as the Daily Beast. We're talking about a previously unknown role in escalation of U.S. training for Saudi forces that are bombarding Yemen in one of the greatest humanitarian crimes in the globe today. Plus, a former CIA interrogator advising ICE on interrogations. We'll talk about that with Ken. We've got new updates on the crimes against democracy in brazil the coup there judicial lawfare and what it teaches us 
about an unaccountable judiciary in our own country as Democrats continue to fumble as Brett Kavanaugh looks ready to reshape a far-right reactionary Supreme Court for generations. Malcolm Gladwell shockingly doesn't get it. We might tip him into the gulag. Maybe that's why Philip Morris put him on the possible media contacts to butter up, that sort of naivete. Yeah, maybe so. Or maybe it was the fact that he wanted to actually be a PR man before he was a journalist. All that, plus, of course, a brisk a minute, Amazon valuation, and you, DSA, breaking new ground as momentum builds for Julia Salazar in her race for state senate here in New York, joining Lee Carter and others bringing real left governance to state politics as the momentum for change in the long term is on our side and for patrons the post game stays global and expands and we're actually adding some new segments to it we're back and ready to go and first we got to forget john mccain and we've also got to call out disable disarm do away with the delusional dead end dangerous manners based policy failure driven militaristic zombie centrism which is going to get us all killed luckily we were on vacation during john mccain's funeral and the sort of mainstream liberal orgy uh, over mccain and his legacy and look i'm not happy that the man is dead and I feel for his family. I'm not going to do some edgelord joke about it. But the reality is, is we judge a guy on his political record. And his record was atrocious. Going back to opposing making MLK a holiday. Supporting every war from the invasion of Grenada to, of course, the invasion of Iraq. Pushing for military escalation in Syria. Libya, he supported as well. There was not a single place that this guy didn't want to bomb. He was a skillful media player and an endless war promoter. He also, frankly, yes, he withstood torture and abuse in Vietnam, which no human being should ever fight, uh, face, period. But I'm sorry. The guy voluntarily went to drop bombs on Vietnamese villages and as part of an imperialist, borderline genocidal U.S. war, which killed an untold amount of Vietnamese and was wrong, morally and strategically. And I don't know if we're in the sort of Ken Burns rebrand of Vietnam as some type of high-minded mistake of Kennedy and Johnson versus the unremittent crime that it was. This guy should not get credit for that. He also co-produced this. I think you should start paying the amount of taxes that every socialist in this country thinks you need to because if you think the government is so good at okay. spending money, look at the VA. Oh, no, no, because it is dangerous. I'm just dangerous. Told you dangerous. Countries what about that this country? I'm sorry. Hold on, hold on. on. Everybody, everybody, everybody. God bless you all. I hate that bell. Hold on. About, then everybody stop talking over each okay. other and I won't hit the bell. The population Don't make 300,000 people <laughs> in, well, any way, can can, in no hand? way can be related in any way comparably to the United States of America. Okay. I'm sorry. All if right, you go think ahead. it's good, then you need to be paying the amount of taxes that in let her, let, her, let her get her thing and go oh, ahead. Let let because it's yes. petrifying to me that this is being normalized. All right. Yes, Meghan McCain having a public massive anxiety attack because her trust fund might be modestly taxed to provide health care for people. That was his daughter, who he raised on beer heiress fortunes and in nine houses. We need to be clear about who John McCain is, but we also need to be clear who John McCain was, rather, in his political record, and we have to judge it for the hard, far-right, and militaristic, um, and occasionally savvy one that it was. We also have to note as an example that, yes, he gave the famous thumbs down for Obamacare. He also voted for the tax bill, which not only, in fact, gutted Obamacare itself, 
but is generations extending of mass inequality and wealth redistribution to the top 1%. He stayed in office, allowing his seat to be appointed by a Republican governor, further uh, skidding the wheels on the far-right extremist agenda, which he occasionally hemmed and hawed about in public. He's part of a sanctimony caucus in the United States Senate, most prominently with his fellow Arizonan Jeff Flake which like to make a big show about not liking how crude and disgusting and stupid and almost certainly incredibly corrupt Donald Trump and company are, but never did anything substantive to stop it. And it's the same yearning for a posturing, the ultimate elevation of style over substance in presentation and bearing which is allowing for a rehabilitation of George W. Bush because of this moment with Michelle Obama. Yes, you can see if you're watching, this is, of course, a very sweet moment where he snuck some candy over to Michelle. I do have a longstanding theory that George W. Bush might, um, there might be some crushes involved here from Condoleezza Rice to Michelle Obama and all power to him. Uh, and look, it's very, it's not nothing to have a Republican leader, frankly, occasionally semi-indicate that he doesn't like public racism. But the rehabilitation of him in games of manners, ignoring the gutting of civil liberties, a global torture regime, an invasion of Iraq, the peeling away of the small, tiny, infinitesimal welfare state, tax cuts for the wealthy as well, massively increasing inequality, deregulating Wall Street even more than Clinton, setting the stage for a global economic meltdown and waging an unrelenting war on the environment. Just because the guy paints and isn't Donald Trump is enough for a certain type of manners obsessive. Last year, Emmanuel Macron was the sort of man of the moment for the centrist posturer. And these centrist posturers, yes, they might be worshiping far-right, hard-right Republicans like John McCain or George W. Bush, but they often find their political homes in the third-way neoliberal center-right of Emmanuel Macron or Tony Blair or Barack Obama or Bill Clinton. Emmanuel Macron's environment minister just resigned in a live interview in French radio because of the Macron government's repeated failures to live up in any substantive way to its environmental rhetoric and inclinations, even though he promised to, quote, make the planet great again. Of course, a serious environmental policy, a green policy, is impossible to reconcile with a neoliberal agenda that Macron represents. A Macron aid, speaking of fascist tendencies, was discovered dressed as a policeman so he could beat protesters personally who were out protesting the Macron government's relentless and savage attacks on labor and on the French social system, which, let's be real, is pretty nice. And why did people worship Macron? Well, because Macron had class, because Macron, according to people like Joy Reid, cut a totally different figure in public mannerisms than Donald Trump. Now, look, Part of these offices is definitely ceremonial, and it definitely involves the cultural template that you set. And Donald Trump undoubtedly is a es vast escalation in a negative and dangerous direction in terms of public advocacy of racism and xenophobia and just general being an absolute trash human. But the clinging and the desire to return to leadership that failed across the board, caused untold problems at home and abroad, and set the stage for the catastrophe of Trump and the grotesque band of mutants he brought along with him, is a guaranteed formula to deepen the march of global fascism in the 21st century. So while you're searching for Macron, whose, camp, whose poll ratings are now down to 31%, whose failures of leadership make the potent threat of the French far right ever present and ever available in France. When you're looking at George W. Bush sneak some candy to Michelle Obama, and you're thinking of one time that John McCain didn't agree that Barack Obama was an Arab, which by the way, kudos to him in the spirit 
But maybe as even Colin Powell, of all people, pointed out at the time, the deeper question would have been, so what if Barack Obama was Muslim or Arab? Let's just note that. And we haven't even touched on the fact that this man unleashed Sarah Palin on all of us. Spare some thoughts for reality and recognize that the only way to fundamentally get ourselves out of the predicament of Trumpism is never going to be through re reverting back to bedtime stories and centrist delusion. The patient is ill and sick, and we've got to solve this fundamentally or it is not going to be solved at all. The time for fantasy is over, and the ultimate fantasy was the theater of the John McCain funeral. I'm just going to run that backwards. Yeah, please. Uh, just so it looks like George Bush is taking candy out of Michelle Obama's. Hey, give it. I, take it. I want to give it to my wife. Come on, stop, black girl eating so much candy. Oh, took it. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> just like my ancestors. <laughs> That's what we did. This is the subtext. <laughs> subtext. Hey, yeah. See that? Barack's a classy boy. He's laughing because he knows what's good for him. <laughs> All right, guys, tee off. <laughs> Gentlemen, back, tanned, and rested, and ready to go. TMBS. I am feeling rested. It's been nice. Um, you know, looking at Macron and, uh, and Trump, I think that there is something to be said about the content of what they mean versus the way that they deliver it. Right. Let's remember when uh, Trump had his famous shithole countries comment. Right. Just, uh, just recently, Macron said something very similar about Africa where he said that these countries have civilizational problems. Right. And you see in there, there's the same kind of germ of colonialism and white nationalism as there is under Trump. The only difference is that Trump just delivers it in vulgar, bombastic language. Um, it, it, and, and you look also, another similarity between Trump and Macron has been, uh, we saw recently is that Trump is now going to be freezing uh, public sector workers' pay. Right. Well, that's very similar to the kind of efforts that Macron has been following in France, tr attacks on uh, on their on their workforce, on their public workforce as well. So if you look at as it, well as trying to introduce lobbying to the game, oh, oh of course, much and, more, much more aggressive uh, business and private sector influence peddling. and privatizing the railways right. and things like that. You know, so right. it's just one of those things. It's like you know, people in our country they just get so enamored. I don't. I, I honestly, I, I have a difficulty understanding it with you know the glam and the camera and the man in the nice suit and the you know. But it's not just that it's a retreat from reality without it, it a doubt clearly that that the fantasy moments of it's macron he's gonna save us i mean we know justin trudeau can't do it because justin trudeau is just too he's just too weak he's not credible so then macron he's too comes canadian on. he's too canadian then macron comes on and he outmans trump on a handshake and he you know, is quoting something about the EU and saying global warming is real. And now it's John McCain and the moment that they all came together. There was no substance to this. I mean, I want to just actually really quickly give a contrast. About, I think, two years ago, there was a forum in South Africa where F.W. de Klerk, Thabo Mbeki, and a president, oh, I'm actually forgetting his name, unfortunately, but he served in the interim. There was a brief period between Zuma and Mbeki. There was a president who served for about six months whose names I'm forgetting. And they actually met and had a forum on the crisis of democracy in South Africa under Zuma. And whatever you think of their prescriptions and their politics, that actually was a meeting of ex-presidents talking about the substance of a massive state of corruption in the Zuma government. That was an actual thing. And now people are talking about you know, well, Obama and, you know, Bush took indirect shots at Trump at a eulogy for a right wing warmonger. Guys, that's not good enough, even by your own fantasy metrics. What is this that you pulled up? Well, this reminds me of, I mean, the, my take on this whole candy thing is that it was calculated to play to the lowest common denominator. Definitely. Like literally children understand what sharing candy is about. Right. And I think that's really what, it, what motivated it. I don't think it was genuine. I think it was, uh, was calculated. Today, we have a sort of opposite scenario where people are saying that they're seeing in this woman behind Kavanaugh at the hearings 
Uh, her name is uh, Zena Bash. She's worked for John Cornyn, Ted Cruz, and Trump, and she appears to be what looks like the the sort of okay. Oh, the okay, the white power sign. Yeah, and yeah. and I think it's it's unclear to me. I think possibly, but my thing is like the gesture is ambiguous her record and actual like um she her, works for white nationalist yes, exactly. politics she's she's yeah. working to put those into law right so like the gesture is sort of secondary and she's point. here to support a corporatist who arrange a relentless war on civil rights on women's rights and destroying workers and making the country a structurally feudal society exactly like yeah. i'm much less worried about the sort of like uh basement white supremacists that might get their jollies off on a on a gesture like that than the actual people in the halls of power that she's i mean she's a very wealthy person too people have went through her uh her financials and yeah she's just some rich functionary for the republicans which means she's a fascist so like that's it her, yeah her hand signals the hand gestures like i think they can maybe give stuff away. Like I'm glad Gorka wore his Nazi pins, so we could maybe right. like mm. key into that. But it's only interesting to the fact, to the extent that it points to something real. And whether like Bush like gives candy to Michelle Obama, what real does that point to? That points to here are a bunch of chummy millionaires who helped co-create the catastrophe we're in by setting in motion a slow motion catastrophe of global imperial adventures, wars on the poor, deregulations of oil, energy, and Wall Street. And that's why we're facing political, ecological, and social collapse. And they have the class to recognize that calling you know Haiti a shithole country is a disgusting racist comment. Good for them. I recognize that one thing is better than the other. Does that make it good enough? And is that the limit of your political imagination or analysis? Well, fuck, God help you. Wait, mention for Excuse me, Allah help somebody you. Somebody like Bush, who's arguably, I mean, is a war criminal. He's right? absolutely, fact, he is literally a war criminal. Yeah, without a doubt, honestly. The fact that Tony Blair is, Tony, I'm sorry, Tony Blair just went to Italy to meet with the fascist uh, interior minister to lobby for an oil pipeline which would uh, threaten uh, eco ecology of Italy, a, a pipeline that originated in Azerbaijan. Tony Blair is lobbying and Lula is a political prisoner. The fact that Tony Blair is free lobbying and Lula has been imprisoned tells you everything you need to know about the utter moral political sickness of the world we're in. Oh, without, without a doubt. But it's also, the thing about Bush is it's just like how cheap is it for him to have been able to rehabilitate his image by painting a bunch of shitty pictures of dogs and Putin <laughs> and passing out candy and Ehud at a, and, <laughs> and passing out candy at a funeral. I mean, if you and were dancing PR for, with Ellen, oh, the dude yeah. danced with Ellen and she didn't even take a minute to be like, Hey, this is awesome. And I'm wondering, have you rethought your stance of aggressively campaigning against my civil rights when you <laughs> ran for president? That is actually something that's so amazing to me, honestly, that Republicans have been able to rehabilitate after years of the most disgusting homophobia. Yes. I mean, this is the kind of things that were in the public square, even like 10, 15 years ago. It's, it's uh, in, a, in a way, it's easy to forget. I mean, it's possible to forget because, you know, that, that paradigm and that the dialogue has shifted so dramatically. And those right. battles have been, uh, you know, those people have been beaten down enough, not enough, though. But to sit there and to say with the straight face that, you know, these people are allies when they were literally arguing against the human rights of people 10 years ago, 10 years ago, and have not publicly reversed their positions. They've just yeah. they haven't even said that they've they just, just been lost like, a court case. They're just like, yeah, it's cool. Now, now we now we dance. <laughs> now we dance. <laughs> you got a W? You're from Texas, Grisgum. You got a W? I can't do it. Oh, yeah? What are you afraid Richard Wolf's got one? <laughs> Come smack you in your big, stupid face. It's too close to home, honestly. Yeah. No, people forget, man. People forget or they don't fully know how. I mean, you had an administration lying about intelligence, distorting intelligence terrorizing people who worked in the intelligence apparatus specifically to engineer an outcome for an illegal invasion, something that by the most conservative estimates have killed a couple hundred thousand innocent people, civilians, probably almost certainly more. And what we get is, and look, the practical reality is it's good that our ex-Republican president says, Hey, it's, you know, it's a little messed up talk about Guatemalan kids like that. 
That is a good thing. And that is good enough for the vast majority of the commentariat who just want this to be, it's, it's the equivalent of those tweets of, if Hillary was president right now, I'd be figuring out what my new bed would be and how nice that would be. And oh my God, when is Game of Thrones back on? And all that bullshit. Because you can ignore the ecological crisis. You can ignore the mass exploitation and oppression of the world and the social conditions bursting at the seams. They, what do they want to just put it off another couple of decades? Because if you kept going, all of these thugs, Trump, Duterte, all of these people were inevitable. If you destroy, why, why, is, why, why is religious extremism and terrorism a potent force in the Middle East? The left is destroyed there. We help destroy it. When there's no vehicle for people, it's vacuum of conspiracy theories, bigotry, and division. Yeah, and you know, I, I, I just, I just say, you know, I, I read a lot of times people talk about um, the Bush administration, and you know, they say things like, "Oh, you know what? It was tough, and I was fighting him tooth and nail, but you know, things were better in those days." And I think that's a real problem um, in the way, like, a, in an American outlook, where it's like we can't. Uh, look at something without having to compare everything like you can't just say you know like bush and the war the war monger that were going on there were bad the attacks on the poor under bush were bad and the attacks that are going on today by trump are bad and the war mongery they're going on today are bad and the war mongery that went under obama's bad it's not this kind of thing where it's like three degrees which one was the ba the nicer war you have to make those calls when as an example and i'll keep saying this look you're voting I'm sorry, you better fucking recognize the difference between a Democrat in that position versus a Republican. That is a structural reality and people need to understand that. If you're doing some type of historical or policy analysis to understand the difference between you know, the mechanisms of one administration over another, that's fine. But if you're just looking for like a randomized like, oh yeah, but that makes me feel comforted to do a random, which by the way, we don't really have time for this, but I mean, you could absolutely make a case that Trump has not been as destructive as Bush at this point. You absolutely can make that case. There, there has not been the same level of foreign interventions and deaths. Iraq still stands alone. There hasn't been an economic meltdown. There, I mean, he hasn't. He's he's certainly benefits from the mass reversal of civil liberties under Bush and codification under Obama, but he actually hasn't done a new set of them. I mean, Bush dismantled things through the Patriot Act, Homeland Security, the template of global unaccountable wars, people torturing people and not being held accountable. Uh, that's under Bush. And obviously, you know, look, I mean, I think Trump formalizing that the Republicans are essentially a Nazi party is obviously going to have its very <laughs> has a unique imprint. Okay, let's be real about that. But one could make the case that at this point Bush has been more destructive. All right, there are counterforces though, and that's why we got to get to the shout out. And we're back. We're back. <laughs> dinner, dinner, dinner. I don't want to get dinner. Key. Who says dinner that? Key could give us a shout out. Who says and we're back? Ill. Top of the line professionals. Let's get to uh, the shout out. Shout out, shout out. Creepy. Shout out, shout out, shout out. Weird. I think that's creepy. It, 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 it's incredible. Shout oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking out, at something on my phone. What? What? Crazy. Alex Jones, huh? Phone shots, Alex Jones? Shout out, shout out. That's creepy. Shout out, shout out. That's weird. Shout out, creepy. Shout out, weird. Shout out, crazy. Shout out, shout out. This is crazy. Shout out. This is out of control. Shout out. This is weird. Shout out. Mike Thernovich. Uh, Mike Thernovich is not the subject of tonight's shout out, although we always shout Mike Thernovich out because he has been helpful for everybody. He's been very helpful for the numbers, yes. the old metrics. So always want to thank I mean, I mean, Thernovich. I hope you guys out with your metrics for yeah. free. I feel like you guys could have a little booth. Uh, Michael's in, in launching his own show, majority's been doing well, but. I think you guys could take it to another level. Did you save that? Save it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No comment then. Well done, Matt. I saved it. Okay. Uh, shout out goes to the Democratic Socialists of America. There's a huge amount of momentum for DSA. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Yes. 
The McCain tweet was excessive, but people, it is still an incredibly good thing that she's going to Congress. It's a huge accomplishment. Keep your eye on the bigger picture. Julia Salazar, great candidate, huge momentum. She's going to survive the silly tablet smear, and she's going to do a great job <laughs> representing. <laughs> right. Representing. See? Mike Thernovich, MikeThernovich.com. She's going to do a great job representing the interests of real people in Albany as a state senator. And, of course, I would recommend people also vote for Cynthia Nixon and Jumani Williams as well. Uh, and now DSA has hit its first 50,000 members. Look, guys, this is how things start. This is the momentum. This is the beginning. Before 2016, this was a completely not on the map. This was something that was not politically relevant since the early 70s. Uh, and there was a contingent of people, by the way, that I want to just be really clear about. Whether or not, you know, there's various political disagreements, battles, that's great. That's healthy. There's going to be some people in DSA who have much more moderate politics, but they had kept the flame going. They were in meetings in the 1990s where there were five people there, and they must have thought they were crazy, being like, why are we the only ones who aren't happy with, you know, uh, attacking and racializing welfare and deregulating Wall Street and clearly living off of bubbles? Um, they held the flame, and that flame is growing for a world where everybody has health care, a world of radical ecological uh, protection and restoration, rights and justice for all categories of people, and mass solidarity for democratization of the economy and a global system built on solidarity, freedom of people across borders, and not just goods and services. And we have true momentum and true vision. DSA is a huge part of that. That's a huge threshold. And let's keep it going. Shout out DSA. There's a lot to be optimistic about. Um, and I think in a way, I'm going to keep covering what's happening in Brazil because it's very important in and of itself as far as I'm concerned. I think imprisoning the most successful president of modern politics, which I think Lula da Silva absolutely was, there's not a comparable record in the aughts of bringing 30 million you people out of poverty. Yeah, you watch your mouth. I was before Lula. I'm American Lula. I'm American Lula. <laughs> <laughs> I'm American Lula. There actually is a clip. I don't know if we'll play it, but it's when uh, Obama first meets Lula, and he's like, that's the man right here. <laughs> <laughs> Most popular politician in the world. Um there's there's really uh, just basically Lula, the Supreme Court over uh, the Brazilian Supreme Court ignored a directive. The United Nations Human Rights Commission actually ruled that Lula needed to run for president, that it was an undermining, obvious undermining of Brazilian democracy to have the by far leading candidate, a usually successful president jailed on incredibly flimsy charges, to not participate in the election is obviously an attack on democracy in Brazil. Number two, now, Fernando Haddad, who might, who will most likely be Lula's stand-in, well, all of a sudden, prosecutors have said they're opening a case against him. What a shock in terms of the obvious political machinations going on against the Workers' Party in Brazil. And don't forget that before the impeachment of Dilma on accounting tricks, literally, she was impeached on accounting tricks, the Workers' Party has won four elections in a row, or five elections in a row, actually, I believe. Four, you know, two by Lula, two by Dilma. The current government of Michel Temer is not democratically elected and has instituted a mass austerity regime and attacked in, uh, the collective right to bargain. So there's also a lesson here about lawfare. There's a role that the United States has played in attacking pink tide leaders across Latin America. There's a question of understanding that we can't be involved in moralism. There's a problem of corruption in Brazilian politics across the board. Absolutely, it implicated the Workers' Party. Corruption of the Workers' Party mostly had to do actually with figuring out mechanisms, not of personal enrichment, but of funding campaigns. And as long as you have campaign funding that isn't state-funded and allows money to wash into it, there's always going to be those types of problems. And the distinction being is that the Workers' Party use those deals to actually leverage a social democratic policy that advanced society for all Brazilians in the successful presidency of Lula da Silva. And it's also a lesson about 
the dangerous anti-democratic nature of the judiciary and the attacks on democratic forces by an unaccountable, unelected force, a judiciary whose wages have risen in an austerity government. If you wonder why the Republicans are so concerned with the American judiciary. Look no further. And it might not be as dramatic as the political imprisonment of a president and the undermining of a democratic election. Might. I want to emphasize that the, word. What happened with the Clintons was pretty fucking nuts. It was 90s. pretty fucking nuts. And that's with a, a, a fam of Clintons were moderate Republicans by any legitimate standard of policy. And they still went to complete war with them over essentially nothing in terms of actual policy difference. In Brazil, you actually have some differences. Not to mention the fact that that's going to be really hard, guys, when, and I think we will, I think we will elect left politicians. I think the momentum is with the left, broadly speaking, in the United States. And I think public opinion is going in the right direction on everything from healthcare to intervention to rights of all people. But uh, right-wing Supreme Court, yeah, it's going to throw most of that stuff out. And it's a dual process of getting serious about a broader reform and critique and clawing back of democracy from the judiciary, which is the radical critique, but also getting really fucking serious about a liberal and left judicial strategy to train lawyers to have a serious understanding of the political stakes of the justice system because obviously that's been catastrophically underestimated by both people who voted against Hillary as a protest and also by the Obama administration who was not nearly aggressive enough in filling up circuit court seats as an example and was not nearly political enough and how they played the, uh, a back against the Republicans unbelievable travesty of refusing to have hearings on Merrick Garland. It's both and. But Brazil should undermine a moralistic di uh, discourse around corruption. Corruption is never just corruption. There's deeper implications and deeper questions there. And, t and frankly, capital itself is corruption. It is a distortion of the process. It's an inequity of democratic outcome. Why a party is engaging in corruption and what the context is. People in the United States will say all the time, and partially they're right, look, you gotta go in and mix it up if you wanna achieve outcomes. That's a defense that people will use of the most neoliberal, non-delivering democratic governments imaginable. And then they'll turn around and talk about a successful worker party's government in Brazil, which had a solid social democratic record in a developing country. And then all of a sudden, oh no, those types of deals are totally unacceptable. Well, why? And why would an administration of, under Hillary Clinton's leadership at State Department, which supported the coup in Honduras and which coordinated closely in a broad reaching corruption probes, which seemed to always target leftward governments in Latin America, when of course, corruption is a problem very much across the political spectrum, in fact, everywhere. And those left governments, even the most, you know, even ones that were not nearly as successful as Lula or nearly as democratic as the Workers' Party, achieved better things for labor, for poor and indigenous rights. And that is what you have to look at, not just some top line story about a sort of moral posture. And you have to look at the fundamental danger of an unaccountable judiciary on democracy. That is the lesson of the political imprisonment of Lula da Silva and what's happening in Brazil. All right, guys, we're gonna do a little bit of a talk about why it's time to become a patron of TMBS, and then we're gonna come back with Clen Ken Klippenstein. But we're gonna wait till the beat drops. That is Dr. Dre, man. He is insane. This is new. This is pretty new. It's like 2016, I think. I watched the Defiant Ones on vacation, and that is a really interesting documentary about the relationship between Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine, and essentially, like, they between those two, they are two of, like, basically the main people of modern pop music. Like, everything from... 
Tom Petty to Death Row Records to now, of course, Beats by Dre and Apple Music. And it's a pretty fascinating story and two really interesting characters. Um, and there's a lot of problems there, too. It's fascinating. Guys, it's time to become a patron of TMBS. You are going to get a full and broad and expansive political education. This full show every week that tackles everything from international relations, diplomacy, history, politics. We've got the comedy. We've got Griscom on economics. We have everything coming at you. Some of the best guests and crew imaginable. It's all here week in and week out. And then we have a post game. Post games are uh, a lot of uh, video reviews, video segments, um, usually in the current news cycle, but with a little bit more of a global focus. That's a really important part of the show. We're looking for those connections, and we recognize that even as the evildoers, let's get into George W. Bush mode, evildoers like Steve Bannon think globally. That's why he's jetting everywhere from advising a far-right candidate in Brazil to going to Australia to uh, fearmonger and race bait about China. He's thinking in these terms. We need to think in these terms too. That's why this show has a grassroots and global focus because these things all have patterns. They all have, uh, you know, they all relate to each other. And especially when you think of the U.S. role in the world. The post game is also going to have a new sort of clips that we're going to start introducing that follow in the thread of history. Because as you know, for patrons, we have illicit histories on everything from Silicon Valley fascism to every facet of U.S. foreign policy to the political personalities that shape our world. We're going to start in the post game using archival video clips. We're going to call it digging in the crates or bringing that back and talking about um, those clips, whether they be from the 60s or whether they be uh, political theorists or historical moments or cultural, artistic or sports moments that are worth knowing about in and of themselves and shed a light on the time we're in. We really want to be kind of like history and context providers. So you're anticipating the future well, understanding the moment as clearly as we can, and then always digging back so we know why we got where we are. That's what we do on this show. We also have a really incredible Discord community, which people who are patrons get to join. It's happening 24-7. There's live shows. There's political movements. There's conversations. There's a lot happening. There's Ask Me Anythings on there regularly as well as Mel's uh, members of the crew. We're starting those soon as well. And at 21 and above, there are regular, twice about either once or twice a month, group Skype calls with me. Um, Patreon is having a lot of problems with billing. So this last month kind of, uh, it's been, yeah, really frustrating because there was this, you, we, we hit a certain great number and now we fall off about 90 people from that. Um, and a lot of that is because of things like card declines and notifications on banks. So please, um, make sure everything's up to date. I'm really sorry that Patreon is a hassle. You can always message me if you have any questions and I'll do my best to resolve it. Patreon is, you know, it's it's paradoxical because obviously it's great in terms of allowing us to get this going quickly and allowing creators that had no money as we did literally none in the beginning to get things started. Um, but there is some real, you know, there's some, some trouble with the services. So please just make sure you're up to date. Make sure everything's good to go because that also affects... Um, you know, the plans we have, uh, particularly as we get out to 2000 patrons, there are going to be a few more things that we do. Um, and, but obviously this is about uh, sustaining, uh, you know, what we already have. Um, and it's been great momentum. We appreciate all of you. Time to join patreon.com slash TMBS, patreon.com slash TMBS. Become a patron today. Keep sharing the word. Subscribe to our new YouTube channel. As soon as that is monetized, we're going to start doing these live shows on there as well. If you haven't done it yet, subscribe to The Michael Brooks Show on YouTube and start sharing those clips. People have been talking about how new people are getting into the show uh, through those smaller clips. Of course, you can also subscribe to it on iTunes. We have 349 reviews there. Throw us a review. That helps get us new people. Thanks, everybody. We're really believe in what we're doing and we appreciate all of you being a part of it we'll be right back with ken klippenstein so joining us now is ken klippenstein no relation that we know of 
to a couple of very important brothers who are very important members of the hashtag resistance. Where is our country? He's also an investigative reporter for TYT Network and the Daily Beast. Ken, thanks for being here, man. Hey, thanks for having me. Are you related to the Krasenstein brothers? Uh, that, deter- that depends on how much Bitcoin they, they have <laughs> kicking around when they pass away. Ooh, so if they wow. have a lot of that, maybe I am related to them. <laughs> you sound like that. you are of their ilk. Yeah, what do you know about mar- <laughs> multi-level marketing? Yeah, it's yeah. unfortunate. People, a lot of people earnestly, like, you know, you're joking, but a lot of people earnestly mix this up just because, uh, you know, I mean, I'm left of center. But uh, there are a lot of folks that don't know that there's something to the left of liberal. <laughs> and so I think they kind of collapse the entire group into one thing. And they, really? But uh, that's, that's so funny. Like, idea. they're looking at your feed, and you're like, okay, I'm a reporter. And so, like, today, as an example, we're going to talk about some uh, really disturbing reporting you have on the U.S. Uh, support for the Saudi just, you know, murder spree in Yemen. We have a story you have on... A CIA agent advising ICE on interrogations, and so somebody's and and we follow each other on Twitter. So you're tw- and you're also you know you're a funny dude. So you put out some, you know you you'll joke, and then you have all these like serious stories on, you know uh, the corporate sector on ICE and all this. And then the Krasensteins, I don't follow either of them, but people do like to send me their work, and I see a lot of. Oh, God. Uh, uh, look at this George W. Bush giving Michelle candy. This is my country I want. They're big uh, resistance Kickstarter guys. They're resistance kick. See, a, a really fucked up part of me has a huge amount of respect for the hustle. Like, if, if you're going to, if there is money, like, if you just want to make stupid money off of, like, you know, some people who've drank way too much Merlot and Trump has broken their brain, you might even be providing a service for them in a way. Because if they feel an anxiety release by giving you money for various stupid Kickstarters, maybe that's the service. Right? Yeah, I feel like it's, I mean, at least they're offering something, unlike, um, what was the thing Peter Dow did? Uh, Verit. <laughs> you know, like at least we know what they are. They offer uh, catharsis, right? Yes. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And catharsis ain't nothing. Yeah. Uh, and uh, catharsis ain't nothing is uh, uh, two 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 slash HP three Verit code. <laughs> that is a verified <laughs> TMBS. Do you remember? The, I don't even feel. I feel like Verit was amazing because Verit really was. It was like, oh dude, it was, it's yeah. gonna come back. It's gonna be the second coming of Christ. Or he's working on a, a re-release. Are, dude, are right you now. serious? Yeah, yeah. He said it's gonna come back bigger and stronger than ever. What is <laughs> wait? How? Like I don't. I still. If you, I still don't to, know what it is. It okay, was I like was going to ask. Calc you. for me. Yeah, it was like very abstract. It felt like I was in uh, college math again. You were in you college. Know, understand? Like, well, first of all, props well, I sucked to at you. math, so it was all a blur. But that's a lot like what having uh, very explained to me it was like too. It was like. Somebody said, I, what I couldn't understand was like, it was either, was it, it was, because it was like either, you know, a fact check about like, you know, greenhouse gas contributes to global warming. Somebody says that's not true. Like, that's wrong. You know, here we are with a fact check. Or it was like, you know, Kofi Annan said, Donald, you know, no, that's Mandela. Kofi Annan was like, Donald Trump is a Cheeto and I hate him. He is the worst. <laughs> and then it would be like, no, Kofi Annan didn't call, you know, didn't tell Trump to get Putin's dick out of his mouth. That is not true. <laughs> so that doesn't get a Verit code. Like, what? Was that what it was? I don't know. It was something about quotes and you would put it through there and it would tell you. It's very fun. It's funny how f- this, it's sort of. Uh, it, bring, it begs a lot of interesting questions about like uh, epistemology in itself. It's like people want this binary answer of like yes or no. Is it true or no? it's like well we all know from life that things, you know, it's sort of a continuum. Like you know something can have some truth to it or more truth to it, but it's not like yes or, like thumbs up or thumbs down. And it really I feel like belies something to do with the culture. Like people want this uh, the comfort of this simple like yes or no answer to right. things. 
well people people liked the assurance of authority but it's like this weird game right. where it gets mystified into a code like what it reminded me right. of is you know imdb it gives every movie like a, yeah a, so i have a friend we'll explain that to people i so should say i know what you're talking if you about, go on go imdb yeah. like instead of saying imdb dash dash it's like a series of numbers right mm -hmm. i had a friend in college who thought a good way to seduce a lady would be to write on her whiteboard in her dorm room those string of numbers uh, and then can i you, have my board please yeah and then wait it, wait you had a friend in college who thought it would be good <laughs> to write a string of numbers on a woman's whiteboard yeah and then so, so baby put down that <laughs> pipe and get my pipe so up. the idea and that man was q <laughs> <laughs> the, the idea would be that she would she would type in that string of numbers into google and then it would show the imdb page for the movie and that was a movie that they had sort of talked about watching together. Can Ken hear my be uh, my uh, board? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> woof, woof. And uh, it didn't work. I was going to say, <laughs> I didn't picture that working. <laughs> it turned out she thought it was a bit weird, which is how people reacted to Verit. Yeah, people thought it was... <laughs> uh, I'll just say this real quick to yeah. all the ladies out there. Please send me numbers. <laughs> <laughs> okay rain <laughs> man uh so well no but that, that i think is so this is that you know what let's let's stay on this tangent for a minute because to i don't know if you because i because ken first of all uh, i'm not gonna ignore this props to you you're you are in fact a tmbs subscriber so i don't know if you caught um we talked we did a in the context of taking down Jake Tapper's bullshit about uh, Medicare for All and Bernie Sanders a couple weeks ago, we leveled a broader attack on the very enterprise of fact-checking, right? Because it's not that, look, of course, when Trump or Bush or whoever, when they lie, you know, when they make like, you know, two plus two is seven statements or two plus two is 345,000, right? Like, yes, that's a lie about a certain reality. But this obsession that definitely goes back to how liberals tried to deal with Bush, right? That was the big thing. That was the Daily Show methodology. You play a clip from Fox. You play a clip from some politician. They make a claim. Then you make a funny face and you're like, that sounds weird. And then you go to you know whatever scientific body or government agency or whatever – that contradicts right. the claim or then or you play the politician with another clip of them saying something completely different and then and now it's like first of all that actually did not work against bush in fact right like things finally started turning because of like katrina and a global economic meltdown it wasn't because you know there were you know uh, fact checks on comedy central and now in like the trump era it's like yeah we just lie like so <laughs> what like yeah, who gives I, a fuck right like yeah yeah i've i've liberal friends that you know think these kind of things and if you just something that's i find to be productive is just kind of talk to them and say you know it's i do you really think that people the reason people like trump is cuz they think 2 plus 2 equals 7 like they don't that's not why they like him you know like there's something else going on there and when you say that they seem to agree. They're like, yeah, you're right. They probably know that these things are lies. Or like, so it's like then you can have a more serious conversation about like what is like what it, what is driving the interest in this figure other than these like falsehoods or whatever. It's kind of interesting to me, and I'm not you know whatever. Like I'm not like obviously look these people are thugs and they're fascists and they're disgusting and they're despicable and they are everything that everybody says about them, right? Like they're grotesque, they're stupid, they're racist, all that stuff. In, in, and, and I, and look, if you're still, you know, if you, if a pollster asks you tomorrow, what do you think of Trump? And you're like, I'm a hundred percent. I love what he's doing. You are trash. Fuck you. Right. But it is really interesting to me that why was it the political right that in a practical way got just so much more savvy and sophisticated about postmodernism about branding about how people actually make decisions and then the sort of like you know the liberal trained people are still stuck in this like 
brain and cloud fantasy about facts being yeah, liberated. Trump's, yeah, Trump's thing is not an appeal to reason. It's an appeal to um, one's, uh, you know, passion. And right. uh, there is a sort of romanticism to the Trump movement. I'm not saying, I mean, obviously it's horrible. Uh, you know, there was romanticism to fascism, too, right. uh, to Nazism, so on and so forth. But I don't think you should deny that that's uh, a component of the appeal. Uh, and when we talk about fact-checking everything, you're acting like it's an appeal to one's, um, you know, uh, reason, re- one's, one's rationality, and that's just not the case. So, honey, turns out QAnon's actually not Colin Kaepernick in a loose association <laughs> with Bristol Myers Squibb to make our kids trannies. I had no idea. Apparently, there's a fact check that Jake Tapper just put out on that. So we're going to have to reevaluate how we vote in 2019. But what's also amazing to me, though, is that is that this is actually another area where all these people set the stage for this, too. Right. Because they either in the idealistic version, they thought like, oh, yeah, you just fact check them and that'll solve a problem. And it never did. Even under Bush, as we said before. And also, it's like all of you people like you're in industries that are built on spin and messaging and massaging public opinion and science has been totally undermined and compromised by capital like and you know and news was corporate co-opted and distorted so you already gave a world where you know the same people who freak out about facts and institutions they were the ones in the leadership level who relentlessly undermined all those things too, where it did get to the point right. where completely craven liars and you know hate merchants could come through right. that door because there wasn't a gatekeeper anymore because the gatekeepers, you know, right. were doing brand campaigns. Yeah, you make a very good point, and that's that the kind of neoliberalism that preceded Trump, of course he is a form of neoliberal, but uh, different in character. Yeah. Um, I think it really just evacuated everyone's uh, belief in, in, in reason. And, and, like, I think there's a deep cynicism in the country uh, that that, that um, leads them to think, that, you know, everyone's lying to me. All the institutions are lying. The government's lying. Corporations are lying. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, and, and when you have a backdrop like that, then it sort of makes sense that they wouldn't really care that Trump is lying and that he's saying these patently ridiculous things because it's like they've given up on It's just like you sort of, I wonder if they've been lied to so much that they just, uh, you kind of forget that the truth is even a thing anymore. Um, and it, and but it's, as and you it's point out, sort of isn't, that's the problem. I mean, it, it, right. it is, but, they, but we like, I mean, I know I'm not trying to like drag, you know, like people. Right. But it's like, well, maybe I am, but I'm just saying, like, I know people, you know, almost personally who have, like, participated in, say, like, you know, uh, AstroTurf, you know, advertising campaigns, right? Where it's, like, right. specifically working for, say, I don't know, a soft drink client or an energy client to, you know, distort their presence in the public stage and manipulate public perceptions of them. And they're also out, you know, blasting away on social media about no more truth. It's like, well, you were part of the very industry setup that makes people not believe in truth, <laughs> right? Right. Like, I'm reminded of the yeah. scene. I'm reminded of the scene in Mad Men where you see that um, uh, Don Draper he smokes himself after right. telling this stuff, knowing it's like so poignant. And I feel that is the condition of America. I feel like. It's like the way the economy is set up, we all have to uh, – it's like there's so many lies that we all partake in every day. Right. And then it's like you start to sort of – yeah, like, I don't know. It's very – it sort of makes sense to me that there is no truth. It's not as shocking to me as it is to a lot of people. Cause it sort of seems like the natural um, you know, uh, conclusion of a lot of these tendencies. It's, right, exactly. And then, and, then the, and then what was so fucked up was that – we had those versions in 2016 where it was like, okay, Bernie came out and he actually told the truth about really right. important things, right? He told the truth about right. inequality. He told the truth about climate. He told the truth about healthcare and he didn't, you know, he didn't lie. He didn't demagogue and he didn't bring a bunch of fantasy and conspiracy theories and lies with it. And then Trump 
you know, huckster, liar, conspiracy theorist, every, you know, again, I can't emphasize enough. Everything that people say about him is true. I couldn't, I literally cannot picture a more grotesque or disgusting human than Trump. I can't. And he, he's still like, he was like, I remember people would say like, well, why, you know, cause just objectively, like Trump's lies were bigger than Hillary Clinton's lies. But I was like, when Trump lies, sometimes he's tapping into a truth, like looking at Jeb Bush and saying, Iraq was a big fat mistake, <laughs> right? Like right. it takes this asshole to give the most honest assessment of George W. Bush and Iraq. Or in a way, it's like people I think get like, you know, it's like, well, but in a way by Trump lying, he's being honest to himself because he's just so comfortable <laughs> in just what a complete dishonest scumbag he is that he's like, relax. He's like, yeah, I'm lying. That's what I do. Um, and, and it, but, it, but I think you're, you're totally right. And I think the, the part that I'm actually a little surprised by is more that I thought people were a little bit more savvy about this, to be honest with you, because I thought. Because again, I don't like even the people I talked about before. I'm not, I get it. They have to make a living. Like they're in this economy. I'm not trying to moralize their decision making, but it's like you would think if you had an awareness of just even like the advertising industry, you'd be a little bit more like, yeah, I kind of get that facts aren't just facts and giving people information is like that there's more going on here than just, yeah. you know, being a stickler. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, there's a fundamental unreality to, like, the entire economic system. Like, what right. do we make anymore? It's all this high-frequency trading on margins, and, like, everything is premised on these illusions. It's like, yeah, it's like it's finally, and now everyone's shocked that people don't really, uh, you know, believe in reality anymore. It's like, well, we've been setting up the system, like you said, for 40 years now. It's like, what do you expect? The highest market valuation companies, it, it's funny. I mean, it's like on one hand, they do nothing. And then on the other hand, they've completely reshaped our social labor, sexual, retirement, right. mobility lives. And then at the same time, have done nothing in terms of generating mass employment or making things or any of that, right? And, and I think that- Oh, yeah, Silicon- yeah. Yeah. Silicon Valley is such a great example of this. Look at these companies, and every time they have the issues about trying to crack down on, you know, like, uh, I don't know, whether it's violent posts or hateful or whatever, why can't they, why don't they, ever, I mean, there's a number of reasons they don't do it. One funny thing to me is always, they literally have no employees. They're the equivalent, I mean, compare the amount of money in uh, something like Twitter or Facebook or whatever, uh, to if it was like steel, how many people would steel have employed? A shit ton of people. Right. Now you look at these companies, the whole goal is to have everything automated with these algorithms, and that's why people are getting blocked for ridiculous reasons, because you don't have a human sitting there doing it because they want to save money, and they don't want to actually have anyone do anything. And if you, yeah, just look at the ratio of people employed at these Silicon Valley firms that are really supposed to be the drivers of our entire economic system now, since we've offshored everything. Uh, there's no one working at them. They're pretty much empty, and, 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 you know, rel relative to, uh, you know, any other industry. And also, and then, and then also the other big reason is like, it's like, well, why don't they crack down on, you know, fascists and Nazis, right? And it's like, well, yes, no doubt there's internal cultural problems in Silicon Valley. There's, you know, massive disparities in terms of representation of gender and race, and that distorts company cultures. And, you know, that's an important issue. But, but fundamentally, on just a market level, it's like you're never going to ban that which brings clicks because that's the business model, right? right? Like that right. is the most simplest answer to why doesn't this company crack down on X because it's going right. to be harmful for their market valuation because it's that's so, what generates it's, traffic. Right. It's so naive that, you know, these companies are going to self-police. Like it would have to be some form of, you know, public involvement in deciding, all right, well, this is how we're going to... And but the idea of government is anathema. Everyone, it's, right. it's not even that people don't want government. It's like they can't. I don't think they're even conscious of that. Um, there can be some sort of collective uh, response to these things. Like they literally can only imagine. It's like the burning the shoes that we saw yesterday with right. conservatives with these people burning. Like that belies a you know complete um, lack of a political imagination. They can't. They can't imagine political participation aside from consumer choices which is like destroying some object you bought and that's like the most exciting thing you can do like they can't even imagine anything outside of that and that's why this keeps happening with all these ridiculous 
because they're like, what's the craziest thing I could do with my cure in my political, uh, you know, worldview? It's like, well, I could throw my cure out the window, and it's like yeah. the wildest thing they can think of. It's the wildest thing <laughs> they can think of, and and that's another thing that also goes back to the '90s, right? Where it's like, at the same time that we're writing the rules of globalization to totally devalue workers, the environment to lock in property rights at the, you know, for pharmaceutical companies at the expense of AIDS patients, as an example, uh, we're also going to start emerging with these things like corporate codes of conduct and the triple bottom line and companies are going to voluntarily commit to these ethical standards and then consumers can vote with their wallets if they're concerned <laughs> about labor rights or climate. Dick Morris one of the most disgusting, that's another, talk about another fucking, I mean, truly disgusting person. Do one, uh, you know, Google search if you haven't heard of him and you will get nauseous. But uh, <laughs> he had an idea in the 90s that he was pitching that went nowhere, that he wanted to start working for corporations and have them run attack ads on each other. And his first pitch was that there would be a Reebok commercial that would start in a Nike sweatshop and these kids would just be being like wailed on. <laughs> They stitched Nikes and it would be like Reebok, like, because we don't torture children. And in a way, that was actually like a pretty good expression of some of the ethos of that time, right? It was like, yeah, you should really make a fucking stand, man. Buy Reebok. Well, now it's by Nike. Now it's by, well, now it is by, well, now, well, now, I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. As soon as I saw those chuds out there i was i did i was like eh, maybe i will i don't know i'm a puma guy but because you know, like, eh. I'm, I'm not above that there is a part of me that sees that I mean, and also i just love like the idea that they're literally in their yards like inhaling nikes like i'm just picturing and praying for all these like asthma attacks for all these fucking racist losers freaking out about it's amazing. Colin, every Colin time. kaepernick every time and it's gonna happen f yeah it's gonna happen forever until they figure out uh, some sort of some form of political engagement outside of consumption, which is like, it, yeah, it's just going to keep on repeating. It's I don't, you can just see it. Play. It's like we're on this loop, and we can't get. Out. It's like we're relitigating the same thing again and again. And it's like uh, I have a bad feeling that the way out of it is going to be this political romanticism that I was talking about before, um, represented by you know these far right forces. I mean, of course, it could be, it could be far left too, but uh, it's just wild. It, it's almost like the the, the, the maze and the. Um, the Shining, where it, you know you're just wandering and just keep seeing the same thing over and over again. Like, oh, I just <laughs> we need to get out of the cycle. I feel like we definitely need to get out of the cycle. Uh, I never got the piece, guys, but let me let me just uh, start with this. Let's just touch on this for a couple of minutes before you go. And actually, I feel like this conversation was great, even even better uh, than it might have been. But I do want to talk about this reporting you're doing about Yemen, right? So. Going back, I think the Saudi UAE air war in Yemen started in 2015, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah. It was the, the claim of the Saudis is that the Houthi rebels, which are a Shia militia group in Yemen, are backed by the Iranians, essentially that they would be the Hezbollah of Yemen. Now, the Houthis have been around for a very long time, and they are, in fact, an organic group. They are supported by the Iranians. Support has increased since the Saudi air war, but they are not an artificial group uh, sort of created by Iran. They have a, they have a political trajectory in history uh, in Yemen. And there's a lot of other dynamics in Yemen, which we'll get to actually, we're planning an illicit history on it for patrons, but that's just the relevant part of the Houthis. The air war started in 2015. The Obama administration signed off on it and began refueling and supporting the war. I think basically just to get the Saudis off their backs for the Iran deal. Like, okay, you guys I are agree. flipping out. You're bitching about this, whatever. Go murder a bunch of people and cause a bunch of havoc in Yemen. It's not a strategic priority. And of course, the Obama administration, in terms of their drone program, did not put a high premium on Yemeni life to begin with, if we're being real. Under Trump, though, this has increased in terms of air support, uh, in terms of uh, weapons sales, um, and sort of greater coordination. And during this whole time, 
cholera outbreaks, civilian casualties. The Saudis essentially, I mean, doing things like a couple weeks ago, bombing a school bus and not even denying it, just saying like, no, 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 there was a guy on it that we needed to take care of. Uh, you know, essentially like the Pablo Escobar Avianca Air Airlines, uh, you know, defense. Like, no, of course I needed to blow up an airliner. I thought Cesar Gaviria was on it, right? Um, and you've discovered, though, a new level of U.S. Defense Department and Trump administration support uh, for the Saudi war on Yemen. Yeah, so I found contracting documents showing that um, a number of aircraft, um, including the F-15, um, the Defense Department, the U.S. Air Force is looking for contractors to train Saudi fighter pilots in these um, aircraft. And not just the aircraft, but specifically the weapon systems associated with it. So if you look at the contracting document, which is in, I embedded it in the story, um, it shows weapon systems for F-15s, it's got C-130s, it has drones, like, and all of this is going to happen on U.S. soil. Um, you know, you and I know that the U.S. has been intimately involved in this, but I just feel like this is the perfect illustration um, of how close the U.S., how closely the U.S. is involved in all this, as much as it'd like to pretend that we're just, you know, we're in the age of advisor, everything is advisory now, it's bullshit, but that's the new line, because... Americans don't support this stuff by and large, especially after Iraq. So they have to say everything's advisory. It's all bullshit. We're, you know, refueling the planes. I mean, I talked to people in the Air Force. The planes literally couldn't get to most, the sorties literally couldn't get to all kinds of places they're hitting without the mid-air refuel set. Only we or the, you know, British or French have the capability to do, but mostly just us. So, um, and you can talk, it's funny, publicly, they're all, what is the phrase always in the New York Times? It's the Saudi-led you know, U.S. backed war, but right. that's kind of misleading because we're training them. It's our bombs. We're refueling them. We're giving them intelligence. We're giving them logistics. The Saudi Arabian military is not that sophisticated. People don't under. So if you talk to, you know, I have sources in the Defense Department, the DIA, the, you know, State Department, and every one of them will tell you this wouldn't be happening. This literally could not functionally happen if it wasn't for us. Privately, they say that. Publicly, it's the Saudi-led U.S. backed war. So. There was a little bit of movement in Congress. Uh, Bernie Sanders, Mike Lee, and Chris Murphy had a tripartisan bill on cutting off funding for this. There's something in the latest defense authorization bill, the John McCain bill. And actually, let's just add that to the John McCain record. John McCain also aggressively supported uh, what the United States and Saudi Arabia are afflicting on Yemen. But there was uh, some language in there that uh, essentially like Mike, Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, he really he's going to check in with the Saudis and the UAE uh, leadership and really make sure that they're doing their best <laughs> to not murder a bunch of people and bomb funeral homes and school buses. Uh, you know, besides the idea of, you know, Mike Pompeo or anybody in the Trump administration caring about civilians sort of being just a, you know, a disgusting joke in and of itself. I mean. Is that literally what it is? It's just like, hey, you know what? Could you check in on them and be like, hey, are you guys like doing mass murder or no? I don't know if you saw it, but the State Department actually congratulated the Saudis on saying maybe we made a mistake in the bus, the school bus bombing. And there was a huge fanfare and all the press Big growth. talking about how great it is. Yeah, that's what they said. Right. It baby steps, right? So <laughs> maybe 50 years from now, we'll stop killing huge numbers of uh, children. I mean, the kids were like, the school bus bombing was insane. Did you see the photo of the backpacks yeah. littered all over the place? Yep. The kids were up, to, the kids were ages like nine and under. Yep. You know, like, Jesus yep. Christ. This the whole thing is indefensible. The only reason it happens is because no one knows, no, Americans don't know that it's happening. They would never support it. Um, it and I really think you're right to say that it, we're not really getting a whole lot out of it. We're just sort of do. I think, I've talked to a lot of people on my understanding is that we're doing it because they asked. And what about the role? With... I'm sorry. I'm just. There's no geostrategic. No, nobody serious thinks Iran is like a you know major. I mean, certainly there's some forms of support, but that's not the um, salient reason that that we're there. We're there because the Saudis wanted us there. Well, no doubt about so, that. But what about the role of arms manufacturer lobbying? I know. I mean, my friend Jay Cassano has done a lot of reporting on this. I mean. Raytheon, uh, uh, Buck McCunin, I think his name is, lobbying firm. What about just the raw, you know, there's a lot of money to be made here. What about that? That That's certainly true. I mean, but yeah. that's always an ambient, that's always an ambient force for, uh, you know, conflict anywhere. Mm -hmm. I think, I tend to be optimistic about what we could do about Yemen if there was even the tiniest bit of a social movement. Um, because it, it's just not that profitable. So there are 
there are the arms contractors, but you can just dump that on any. I mean, we give the Egyptians M, uh, Abrams tanks all the time that they never use. I mean, you can, uh, you know, you you can dump those arms on in any uh, you know totalitarian government where the people have no say. So that certainly like is yeah. a factor. The whole world to lay to waste. I, Maybe we could just ease up on the direct murdering of children at such an aggressive right. rate. We could just you know right. send it to an Egyptian dictatorship. We seem to have some competency at that. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, yeah, we're not. It's not a hugely important thing for advancement of you know the U.S. Uh, uh, you know um, control of the region or whatever else. So I, I think, and that's why you see these surprisingly close votes in Congress um, for various forms of um, you know holding them to account. And I think if the public got just the slightest bit involved, it would really shift quickly because it's there's just it's just such. You know, internationally, it looks really bad. It's very costly. It's uh, people don't seem to like uh, the, the king is described by German intelligence, it, or the crown prince is described by German intelligence as headstrong and and reckless in, in doing this. Hmm. So it's not even really beneficial to Saudi Arabia. I don't think. I think if they're doing it out of a paranoia, they see a the, the shadow of Iran everywhere they everywhere they look. So for all those reasons, I don't. I, I really think that this could be pushed back in a way that perhaps other conflicts couldn't. Let's get on it. TMVS Intelligence describes the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia as a fucking moron. Uh, <laughs> Ken, real quick, before we run, I just wanted you to lay this out for us as well. I mean, obviously, the sort of uh, ICE terrorism of immigrants across the country has been a little bit less in the news in the last couple of weeks, but it continues apace. It's part of the white nationalist Republican strategy. Uh, abuses continue across the board. Obviously, the next phase is on legal immigrants. You reported a couple of weeks ago that there was a role uh, for that there was a connection between people who had been involved in CIA interrogation, which I read as torture programs, in training ICE operatives. What's that about? Just break it down for us before you go. So, the head of the entire polygraphing uh, unit at the CIA, no, no longer now, but uh, previously, um, he's training ICE agents in how to conduct what they call elicitation. He was very clear to me, and he didn't want me to, <laughs> I have to be careful, he didn't want me to use the word interrogation. He mm -hmm. claimed that it was just elicitation. But I encourage listeners to look up the definition of the two words and find that there's not, you know, an enormous gulf between them. Um, anyways, so uh, he was head of the polygraphing at CIA for, I think, more than a decade. Before that, he was the personal bodyguard to the CIA director. I can't remember which one, maybe Director Colby, I think. Um, he'd been at the CIA for decades. He only retired. He retired not long ago, and so that's really all we know is that he's training them in. And what was interesting? So I talked to some ICE people. There's a lot of different people in ICE. There are like ones that were moved there from different agencies, and they tend to really hate the mm -hmm. um, ones that are in charge of deportation because not all of ICE is like deporting. I'm not saying ICE is good, I'm, but there are different like um, characteristics yeah. to the different kind of people that join. And so I talked to these guys, and they were astonished that they're getting this training. And I said, uh, you, know, you know, I asked why. They said that, uh, you know, these guys aren't involved in, like, intelligence collection. They're literally just, like, security guards. Like, they're supposed to slap the handcuffs on and put you in a paddy wagon. The notion that, you know, a highly trained, sophisticated, uh, you know, intel former intelligence official is training these guys seemed really disturbing and, uh, you know, frankly, surprising to them because they just said, like, these... Um, you know, I don't want to be offensive, but they, the words I heard used from, you know, multiple uh, former ICE is that they're kind of hicks and that they're not really, they're just given very simple uh, tasks. Like, they don't have much education, they don't have much training, and so they couldn't understand um, why these very, why, why this kind of, why these kind of strategies are being taught to, like, you know, very simple um, enforcement officers. TMBS intelligence describes them as fucking morons. Uh, Ken Klippenstein, I really appreciate your time, man. Klippenstein, man. I'm sorry. I messed that up. Don't worry about it. Ken Klippenstein, he's an investigative journalist for TYT Network and the Daily Beast, uh, just always doing really important reporting, as you heard uh, here um, with the stories with regards to Yemen, CIA, and ICE. Uh, you should follow him on uh, Twitter. We'll have links to all the ways you can follow Ken's work. Uh, Ken, I really appreciate your time, man. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey, thanks a lot. It was fun. Appreciate it. We need to get Ken to more followers than the Krasensteins. Yes, this is important. This is very important. 
And then we'll all launch a multi-level marketing project. Yes, exactly. Right? That's phase two. Yeah, that's phase two. GetRichMillionaires.com. Yeah. yeah. Hi. I'm Michael Brooks. You know, a lot of you are upset about what Donald Trump is doing to this country. I am too. A lot of you are also looking for financial freedom. And real estate opportunities. And real estate <laughs> opportunities. What if I told you that there was a system where you could resist our fake president and also create the kind of financial freedom that you've always dreamed of? We have a program for you. It's called the resist Cheeto method <laughs> for financial and real estate freedom. Um, all right, guys, we got to get to the gulag. Is it exile now? I think, all right, maybe we should take a poll on this. We're, we're always into switching up the names on this and keep having the, keep the heat off of us. keep the heat off of us and having a kind of fresh and adaptive thing. And I'm always of two minds. So honestly, like when Matt Taibbi was talking about like actual like historical realities of gulags, I had like a yeah, that's we need to switch up the name. <laughs> and then when I get like a tweet from somebody being like, ah, you're not, that's a gulag. That's, I can't believe that's disgusting. I'm like, I definitely want to keep the name gulag. So I'm a very I have conflicted emotions about this. Obviously, the exile segment is not. You know, that does not pack the punch of Gulag, although it could be Gulag-esque. Because when I say exile, I don't mean like party in Tangiers. I mean like, you know, go to a very cold place where you're not heard from again. And are re-educated. And are potentially yes, re-educated. So they're, right. This, <laughs> thank you for spelling it out, Matt. I like how pointing to it and you got us there so i think for this one let's do one more gulag and we're going to put out what is this this is the song exile by enya <laughs> <laughs> all right you know what let's text out exile was it the fuji was it enya that the fujis took the sample without asking for from was it enya oh that's possible on ready or not Probably Sail Away or something. I don't know. No, it was Ready or Not. And it was funny. I saw an interview with Praz and they asked him about it because it was like a big thing in the 90s. And he was just like, yeah, we thought like she's in Iceland or whatever. She won't know. That's awesome. <laughs> he just totally owned Dang. it. He was just like, yeah, we thought. He's like, yeah. we." And he basically was like, we could have given her like $10,000. And instead there was like a lawsuit where we probably they probably had to pay her like hundreds of thousands of dollars because Ready or Not was a big song. Most of the time, it's easier to ask forgiveness than it is a um, uh, permission. permission, but not when intellectual property lawyers get involved. Right. Exactly. <laughs> intellectual property lawyers are the bane of humanity. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell, not really on my radar. No. Uh, Mark Ames and Yasha Levine, they used to have a site which was called, I think, Shame. Shame, uh, something hacks and media abuse, something. And like they that. did an amazing takedown of Malcolm Gladwell, where they basically reviewed everything from uh, him being very susceptible, I think, to influence from the PR industry to the fact that he actually got his start writing at a far right periodical. And then everybody, I think, kind of generally knows Malcolm Gladwell is kind of writing. I don't know. You know, bubblegum. And I, I look, I've found Gladwell's pieces of time to be fun bubblegum. And, you know, the he's 10, a decent 000, writer, gaysly, occasionally, I don't know. He's a magazine writer. The 10,000 um, hours thing is intuitive enough to be sort of somewhat interesting, even though I don't think it's maybe as clinical as it's presented. Probably like, not. It's sort of, it's, he's sort of like, it's sort of bite sized smartness. That is the perfect description, but and not, and and we're not like above that, is what I'm saying, right? So I'm not going to just like do like a you know, Malcolm Gladwell has done some you know stuff that is fine, stuff that I've enjoyed. Although I honestly don't read him regularly. He's not. Is he still right at the New Yorker? Ooh, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Anyways, David Remnick. I think he's podcasting now. Actually, <laughs> Yeesh. Yeah, he has a really rough show. Uh, called uh, Revisionist History, which has been uh, recommended to me a few times. It's not good at all. Be all right, yeah, get the fuck out of here. Okay. 
that just went down a couple of notches. <laughs> so uh, here's the thing. David Remnick asked Steve Bannon to go to the New York Ideas, New Yorker Ideas Festival, which already sounds like an incredible drag besides the open bar. It's like Ozzy Fest without the grift. It's like Ozzy Fest without the grift, but probably more boring. And David Remnick is going to have a conversation, or was, because now it's been canceled because of a public backlash, which frankly I think was a waste of time too. It all doesn't matter. David Remnick was going to ask Steve Bannon a bunch of questions that Steve Bannon has been asked in countless interviews, which is like, are you actually a racist? And Steve Bannon's like, no, I'm not a racist. It's about economic nationalism and globalists. And he's going to do his sort of warmed over mystical Buchananism with outright fascism and, you know, be in the limelight and get attention and be accorded respect as some type of global intellectual and conspirer, which is obviously what he profoundly craves. Okay. There was a reason that he was a thwarted Hollywood player. People, if somebody could have just given this motherfucker contracts to write historical novels about Sparta in the nineties, we might've been saved a lot of problems. And I say from now on, we need to take you know, enraged 50 something white guys with a little bit of resources and delusions of grandeur, unfortunately, a little bit more seriously, because I think somebody should have put the bullet and, uh, you know, I don't know, giving this guy some fucking production credits or something. Now, Malcolm Gladwell comes out in just stratospheric pretension levels. And I've already said, I don't care. OK, I think if Steve Bannon want, I think Steve Bannon goes to the New Yorker Festival, it makes absolutely no difference. And the only reason that I'm it's like nothing doesn't matter. The only reason I'm glad he's canceled is because it embarrassed David Remnick, who's a bit of a pretentious twat at times. And uh, Steve Bannon, uh, I'm sure, really wanted to be there. And so good. Fuck him. Uh, but Malcolm Gladwell says this. Joe McCarthy was done in when he was confronted by someone with intelligence and guts before a live audience. Sometimes a platform is actually a gallows. Now, he's referring, of course, to, I believe it was Welk, who said to Joe McCarthy, Sir, have you no decency? At long last, have you no decency? And of course, the answer with McCarthy, as it is with Bannon, as it is with Trump, as it is with Jesse Helms, as it is with Paul Ryan, as it is with Mitch McConnell, is no, they don't which is a testament to their entire public careers, promoting bigotry, attacking people, denying health care, polluting the environment, being corporate bagmen, being tabloid hucksters. No, they're bottom feeding scum. Also, that didn't end Joe McCarthy's reign. What ended Joe McCarthy's reign, Matt? Was it a high-minded liberal call out? Or was it a power play? Can you enlighten us with some historical awareness, Matt Lack? So I've pulled up, uh, I think it's David Talbot. Uh, Talbot's his last name, but he yes. did the Devil's Chessboard on the Dulles Brothers. Yes. Uh, an interesting part here. It's, it's basically, it turns out it wasn't the being embarrassed on TV, but it was because... Wait, he, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Hold up. You're saying that a power-mad senator with ultra far right politics playing to the John Birch society, to the military industrial complex, to the head of the CIA in the fifties, to all of the worst and most dangerous components of America from the conspiracy hack in a basement to the head of the intelligence apparatus was not actually brought down by a liberal confronting him on his decency on television. What? It turns out there was a bit more going on behind the scenes. Uh, uh, basically, McCarthy turned his sights and his investigation onto the State Department run at that point by one of the Dulles brothers. I can't remember if it was John Foster. Alan was a CIA. Alan student. was CIA. Yeah, so John Foster was State Department and the Army. So here's, uh, here's just part of this Talbot book. After months of trying to manage McCarthy, Eisenhower finally reached his breaking point. In February 1954, Massachusetts Republican Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, a close ally of the president, privately warned that the Army investigation was, quote, an attempt to destroy the president politically. There's no doubt about it. He is picking on the Army because Eisenhower was in the Army. The following month, the president authorized Lodge to ask for publication of a damning report that the Army had been secretly compiling on the numerous ways that McCarthy and Cohn had bullied and blackmailed military authorities on Shine's behalf. Blah, blah, blah. But you get the picture. He stepped on the wrong toes and that's why he went which is which says a lot about trump right the fact yes. that he's still in there 
I and I think the same thing happened with Nixon. Like Nixon, Nixon. The reasons it wasn't because the Republicans got were thought you know, Watergate was obscene. It was because Nixon was becoming a liability to their other projects. Yeah, he had to go. But mm-hmm. wait, wait. I just want to be intellectually rigorous here. Does Talbot suggest in his reporting that Eisenhower? wanted to look into that military report or perhaps even the military report itself was compiled because they were so moved by a liberal calling out Joe McCarthy on national television. No, I think they've been sitting on that. Ooh. And actually, oh, shucks. a lot of the, uh, a lot of like, especially the Dulles brothers were very cynical about how they let him sort of run into the areas of the sort of new deal deep state that they didn't mind smashing up a little bit. Oh, you mean the Dulles brothers, the two of them between who have been in, who were involved in uh, overthrowing democratic uh, elected governments across the world from Guatemala to Iran and had a far right aristocratic agenda in the United States had no problem selectively using him to try to undermine the accomplishments of the New Deal while fortifying and expanding the post-World War II military industrial complex. I'm pretty shocked by that, Matt. I feel like I'm going to have to say it was probably somebody saying that Joe McCarthy had no decency. So Malcolm Gladwell repeats this total fantasy. And now on top of it, let's just touch on this for a second. If sunlight is the best disinfectant, we've already disinfected ourselves from Steve Bannon in the sense that everybody knows who this guy is. There's no mystery. Even when he was in office, I think his poll numbers were in the teens. He's one of the least popular people in the United States. Most people understand that he's a disgusting, bloated purveyor of hate and nonsense. Some of us also recognize that he's probably the only thing approaching intelligent in that orbit. And he occasionally taps into some uh, issues that are real and then has, you know, catastrophic, dangerous, fascistic uh, solutions for them, in my opinion, in our opinion, in our analysis. So we already know who Steve Bannon is. Now, Steve Bannon still matters because he's a global advocate for the worst that humanity has to offer, the worst politics. He's advising Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil. He's a fascist candidate. He's advising uh, campaigns in Europe. He's supporting the Northern League in Italy. He is uh, fear-mongering in Australia. He's a global public menace. So what does that mean? If you already know who somebody is, if he's already been given a platform to spew his nonsense, which we did need to see, we needed to know who the architect of Trumpism was. We needed to know who this guy is. Well, what's the answer to that then? What's the next step, which nobody from Malcolm Gladwell or David Remnick or any of these people seem to understand? You beat him by defeating him at a power game. And I'll tell you what, you know who understands that? Steve Bannon understands that. Because Steve Bannon will use all of these dumb, corroded, dead, elitist discourses and fantasy mindsets and dead institutions and polite forums to advance a relentless agenda, which would in fact jeopardize at the end of the day, the liberty of a David Remnick, which is why once again, it's only us socialists who actually understand power and get what we're up against, who can be trusted to protect the gains of liberalism. Because liberals are such fucking fantasists that they think that Joe McCarthy, Joe McCarthy, who ruined lives from Hollywood to the State Department, who was along with the whole right wing industrial and military industrial complex of the United States, was using a bogeyman, a fantasy, a lie, a conspiracy theory about communism to fight back against even the most modest achievements of the New Deal, not to mention the sort of early burgeonings of civil rights in the 50s. He was using that to crush all of that and advance his own personal power. But yet he, in some silly movie version of history, was hit and and sort of taken down by the have you no decency comment? Get the fuck out of here. You guys got to grow up. We're on the field now. This is actually happening. And it might be happening with some bloated asshole and some weirdo who I think just wanted to be a movie producer and wears you know, multiple suits and clearly loves being on TV or multiple shirts and loves being on TV. But he's out playing the game. 
and they and what he represents need to be defeated in politics. Politics is the middle. The last thing I'll say is everybody's like, that's the Jordan Peterson thing. He's like, well, you have if you don't have conversation, then there's violence. It's like, no, there's a big middle ground between pointless conversations and physical violence. And that whole realm is called politics. And that's what all these motherfuckers need to be defeated in. Well, this goes back to what we started the show talking about with the sort of bedtime story right. through political gesture. Right. And that's and that's really what it is. I mean, I th- I'm v- I always think of the Howard Dean scream right. as like, is that, re- is that really what took him down? Or is it just the narrative that the media was able to create surrounding that incident that they got to bump off a guy they wanted to bump out to begin with? And I actually don't. Definitely. Yeah. Like, I, I, I wasn't following politics. I was pretty young at that time. But that's when I look back on it now, it's like, really? You see a Trump do all this stuff that doesn't just sink him with the American people? It's not that the scream sunk Dean with the American people. It's because the narratives were easier to control at that time. And like yep. the time with the heavy no decency shirt, you had like a few channels. You had th- three different networks of news all saying the exact same thing about that story, the same thing with the papers. That's not where we're at anymore. And we're not going to ever be back there unless something <laughs> you know, catastrophic happens to the media environment. Right. Exactly. I just, I just want to add that... Uh, I, I'm a little sad that we decided to change the name of the segment for this episode mm-hmm. because I was doing a little bit of research and apparently uh, Steven Pinker and Malcolm Gladwell have a lot of beef between each other. <laughs> <laughs> so they should be <laughs> in the gulag Share together to, to be settle together. it out. <laughs> Man. I would listen to that podcast. I would listen to that Just podcast. Two, I would not. <laughs> two boring men growing to hate yeah, each other boring. over the course <laughs> Boring, overcompensated mediocrities hate each other. Trying to logic <laughs> each other into which one is more annoying. I'm going to have to say, I, I just, the clear pick, I'm sorry, is going to be Pinker on that one. In terms of, I would pick Gladwell over Pinker. I don't think Gladwell's quite as obnoxious. Gladwell, as yeah, Gladwell, like, hangs out with, um, I mean, not that he's the most amazing person in the world, but Ben Simmons is at least cooler than anyone that, uh, yes. that, yeah. No, I mean, but also Steven Pinker is Steven Pinker. I mean, fuck him. Like, yeah. <laughs> like really Jordan Peterson is Steven Pinker's Ben Simmons. That tells you all you need to know about these guys. Word. I'm conflicted, though, because these social psychology people or these people who subscribe to the ideas of, like, great men in, of history and behind closed doors making all decision are pretty difficult. But at the end of the day, at least Malcolm Gladwell has some love of language and words maybe <laughs> yeah <laughs> you could play with that versus steven pinker i don't think i have anything steven at all in common yeah. w- or in, of interest with him steven pinker's dead on si- inside all right let's go to uh we're, we're we're not even calling it the economic minute anymore we're just calling it we we're suggesting he's the griscom in the post game starting next week we are digging in the crates, as I said before. And also, there might be a segment in the works. And I know we've only talked about this off air, and I'm putting Matt on the spot because he hasn't agreed to it. But I think Leck Regulates might be a segment where Matt Leck takes a, a media moment that pisses him off. Or maybe even a Twitter exchange where Matt has I don't have any. terrorized some... <laughs> Local Republican official in Duluth. <laughs> I got uh, three good boys from the Republican Party on uh, of North Dakota, and that I've just I've turned on notifications for them, and I basically just call them a racist every single I time. Lo- I love. I really like those because it's always like he finds like the assistant. You know, it's like the the solicitor for like wayne county or whatever and the guy will tweet out like so proud of what we're doing to help the small business climate and and matt's like oh yeah i think that that's what regional administrators of the national socialist party said and what do you say about this and he has like a link to some like republicans and pedophilia story or something trump saying jeffrey epstein likes his women yeah 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 (laughs) trump saying jeffrey epstein likes his women I mean, I do do that, especially with the Minnesota Republicans yeah. who try to smear all all uh, Democrats like as Al Franken right. sex pests. Right. Um, That's a good phrase. Yeah. Yeah. Al Franken sex pest. But that could I, be like his. That could be one of his biographies. I always <laughs> Al Franken sex pest. When he tries to own it, <laughs> this is his rehabilitation. I'm a sex pest. I I am. Look, I was a sex pest. Well, I, I grabbed I'll, that girl's butt. I'll, I was a creeper. <laughs> I was a creep. But wouldn't you I'm like real. to see me in that Kavanaugh hearing? Actually, yes. Yes, I know. Yes. <laughs> it's a complicated world. Yeah. Uh, um, but but the thing is, you have, to, you have to go after the small fish. 
because one, they're they're realizing like I like twenty five year old like Republican just douchebags right. because they know that they they didn't know that this is what they were signing up for like eight years ago. They probably had like Romney like boners or something like that, and now they just like have to be uh, MAGA youth. See, give yourself a little bit of that. You know what I'm talking about? A little Warren G. Give yourself a little bed, and we're gonna do a little test pilot of this segment. Because you see, I, you see what I'm saying. I have a vision here, and I think it makes sense. This is, and also there's a practical utility to this because we're gonna th- we're we're gonna interject a little bit more, not too much, but a little bit more of like a program, like a strategy guides for people who want to engage in media warfare. We have the longer term activism, like the the segments with Joshua Khan that we're doing, but we're also gonna give you a little bit of like. This is how you debunk this, or this is how you, uh, you know, set some twenty-five-year-old Republican douchebag straight. You don't have it. it, it was be- blocked by Warner. Oh my God, that's unbelievable. It's out of the world is out of control. This sounds like it might be a knockoff version of it. That's but. definitely a knockoff <laughs> version. All right, Matt, keep going. But anyway, so you go after these... these Black regulates. The sort of like yeah. functionaries who... Are, this is like... They're, pro- they're probably not even making that much money yet. No. And But they have to go on and like um, race bait about the Tibbetts murder, for instance. Like uh, right. Right before the family is able to say that. Which like when something like that happens, you throw that into your, you know, recently screenshotted news stories. And you just... Sc- throw that in their replies and the best thing about these guys is they're either they either mute you or ignore you right and if they mute you that just means you can squat every one of their replies and ruin every single like thing that they do that afternoon (laughs) you're a pest yeah exactly (laughs) so like like they're missing out they have to like show hidden replies and they see that like the only reply that they got like all afternoon because these guys only have like 600 right like followers and it's all like other like republicans from other states and it matters because these are the assholes that are gonna this is they're gonna get plucked and they're gonna be running for senate seats and they're gonna be getting judgeships so you can build up a nice little dossier about them yeah so like hey why were you race baiting about that girl who didn't want her family murder um who who was murdered like her didn't want her murder used as like a way to race bait against sanctuary cities which you know fuck all about being from north dakota beautiful and that is the pilot version of lek regulates might have to keep that that uh unofficial version for the actual one we use oh i think that that might work very well it seems chopped and screwed enough now it's time for the Griscom. No, I, I think it is the Griscom Economic Minute. I don't know. Griscom. Time that for Griscom. Time for Griscom. Yeah. All right. Mm-mm. Well, sometime for this music, you're going to need to have like a lollipop <laughs> pacifier in your <laughs> mouth. <laughs> you do a pacifier. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> hey, man. This music's <laughs> rad. You know. Yeah. Let's talk manage. about use value. Yeah, use. Use. <laughs> Um, yeah, so let's uh, let's talk for a second about something I've been uh, looking at over this break. Uh, a really interesting study came out from uh, the Urban Institute. Forty uh, percent of Americans between 18 and 64 struggled last year to pay for basic necessities. A quarter percent of Americans, 25 uh, percent of Americans, experienced food insecurity, meaning that they weren't able to afford basic uh, food products. 18 percent of Americans faced issues paying medical bills. Now, as we know. Real wages have remained stagnant, barely hovering over inflation. But, like, listen to this. Ready for this one? Yeah. The real purchasing power of the American workers, these, so these are people who are non managerial workers, yeah. remains the same as in 1978, meaning that in 40 years, yep. the working class has not gained any significant benefit or purchasing power uh, relative to their, their salary. Uh, since 1978, over all these booms and busts. And that's from the Pew uh, Research Center, if anyone wanted to look that up later. I'm bringing that up because, meanwhile, we just saw that Amazon just hit a valuation of over a trillion dollars. And how does this corporation do that? By underpaying their workers, by relying on uh, public subsidy programs and uh, uh, food stamps to feed their workers who they're underpaying, uh, through a regulatory apparatus that allows them to form a monopoly over the U.S. market, and um, through basically investors for years floating them while they just lost tremendous amounts of money. 
Um, I'd also like to note that we are now in what many people believe to be the longest bull market in history. Right. So while labor is continually degraded, profits operate under their own logic. In fact, suppressing wages is a great way to increase profits. And that's something that I really wanted to hit on because since we've seen uh, you know, in the past 40 years that most corporations have shifted their model to be very much focused on stock prices and the stock market itself. And most CEOs have seen that their pay packages and their performance is rated by how much they can increase the, the price of stocks. We've seen a shift in the way that corporations operate, meaning that they suppress wages, that they don't invest um, in, in their own corporations, and they're much more likely to try to find different schemes to inflate their stock prices, which we saw with all the stock buybacks following uh, Trump's tax cut. Now, this is important because we're looking at another thing that capital does. You look at groups like Bain Capital, who use leverage buyouts to buy corporations. And what do they do? They squeeze labor, they increase the amount of work that people are forced to do, and they lay off incredible amounts of people. Meanwhile, they're taking all the profits from the company to pay off the huge amounts of debt that they racked up to buy that company in the first place. Now, this is important just because in June, leverage buyouts reached $158 billion just in this year, meaning we're going to see much more of this activity. And it's important to note that companies that are taken over by private equity uh, typically see decreased earnings per workers in the years after the firm has been taken over. You look at the story at Toys R Us where all these workers were just le le um, you know, laid off without right. any notice <laughs> right. and were forced onto unemployment. Yep. Um, here's a, a quote from a manager of a Toys R Us who said, they kept cutting off payroll and cutting off payroll, expecting one person to do the job of two people. Now, while this activity is devastating for workers, those who were fired lost their income in a society where most workers live paycheck to paycheck. Those who remained felt the danger, the anxiety, and the stress of being forced to work too long for not enough pay. Um, is this supposedly economic growth? Is this supposedly the strong economy? Now, let's not forget that the source of many of the corporate profits are built off of the exploited labor of people across the globe who toil in horrifying conditions. The important takeaway that I really, really, really want to instill is that we look at the stock market, and a lot of people have been talking about opportunities to leverage the amounts of money. Look, and the stock market is an incredible source of wealth that you can extract and you can use that in redistributive programs, right? Yep. And we look at that, and that is something, and that is all basically extracted from the labor of working people. And it is right and it is just that is it redistribu redistributed to working people. But let, do not let that mislead you into thinking that simply pulling money off of the top from this system will eradicate it. The problem with capitalism not, is not just that some people are rich and some people are poor, but it is the entire apparatus that forces people into to misery and depravity to create the profits that are enjoyed by the few. So any system, no matter how egalitarian its safety net, that uses this current form of exploitation as its economic system is wrong from its start. And we need to be brave and we need to be bold in our strategies for combating the excesses of capitalism. We need to be bold in our attempts to redistribute the wealth that is already there. But we cannot create a system. We cannot allow this engine to continue in any kind of socialist or left project that we're uh, fighting for in the, in, the, in the future. This is the socialist critique of the current world. And the point is to change it. I agree with you 100%. And I want to give a second to let the sincerity sink in before I go, you were really saying something there, man. <laughs> Just picture like Bill Clinton at a DSA meeting. Exactly. It's about the fundamentals of the system. And if you don't address it, you're just tinkering with the chairs of the Titanic. What do you think about that? Do you even care? <laughs> Jesus Christ. No, that was beautiful. <laughs> Ainsley's not. Yeah. Ainsley. Oh, Ainsley? No. What do you think about that? Do you even care? <laughs> I, I have to say, I was thinking about you looking at the photos of uh, Bill Clinton over the weekend at the uh, funeral. Because it's like, you know, you talk about Bill Clinton. Like, I know that you, you like the confidence sometimes when he's like defending himself. But I like the kind of like weird red nose gleeful face that he gets. When he looks oh like he's getting my away god, with something. It's fucking. It's Ariana Grande. I'm at the Aretha oh Franklin. Oh my god! She oh did my god. two costume changes. Two costume I tell changes. You what, I'm that, just sitting, that young lady can perform. I'm just sitting here right by Farrakhan. This is awesome. Uh, no, but I uh, that was that was excellent. Uh, the segment continues to come into its own. Everything 
the show just improves and improves and improves. I'm really proud of what we're doing, guys. Okay. Uh, our friend Joshua Kahn, who's part of Crew, one of our associates, he's the executive director of the Wildfire Project. This Sunday, um, or actually, excuse me, next week, we're doing an, the second part of our activism series. Uh, and if you check out pmpress.com and you put in the uh, discount code FIRE, you can get Organizing Tools, The Planet and a Line in the Tar Sands, which is a book that he wrote on climate activism. Uh, which I've read and I find very helpful. Joshua Kahn, very, very important person, friend of the show, and a serious, I mean, patrons have listened uh, to the first part we did, um, a for real strategist on every category of activism, but with particular focus on capital and its implica on climate and its implications for everything. Become a patron today, patreon.com slash TMBS, and get the whole TMBS experience, all the illicit histories, idea primers, and the post games. The post games are really fun, and they're also going to have some new segments injected in them as well as we continue to refine and grow. On this post game, we're going into some of what's happening in Argentina. We're talking about Nike. We're talking about Kaepernick. Uh, we've each got some picks, and of course... We've got your calls, patrons. We've got your Discord questions. We've got it all. It's time. Patreon.com slash TMBS. And we will have the post game uh, in, for, in the Patreon link. Don't worry, patrons. We will see you all there. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, David and David. Thank you, everybody. 